for our next session, which is linked to secure by design, cyber security as a foundation for digital transformation. Now, the pandemic has highlighted unprecedented challenges for anyone working in public sector cyber security, but predicting what's next carries a lot of uncertainty. With the public sector taking steps to digitally transform overnight to ensure continuity of public services, cyber security is arguably the most most important step in any organization's digital transformation. With a lack of integration between legacy IT and modern security solutions, public sector organizations are left open to cyber attacks and threats, costing millions in recovery. In this panel discussion, we'll discover how the sector can ensure it's secure by design, using cybersecurity as a foundation in the digital transformation journey. We have an incredibly put, well put together panel who I am really excited to be able to introduce to you all. Joining us today, we have Jonathan Pownell, who is Senior Digital Specialist at the National Audit Office. Sean Galvin, who is Head of IoT Security Policy at the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. We have Liban Engel, who is Category Lead Cybersecurity Crown Commercial Service. And finally, we have John Cook, who is Head of Cyber Insurance at the Ministry of Defence. Now, just like our previous session, I'm I'm really keen to put your questions to our panel. If you're just joining us now, um, you can just put those questions in the ask your question box and I will try and get through as many as I can. But first of all, I would like to welcome our panel to the virtual room. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. Um, I thought it'd be really good to start off just by learning a bit about yourself, what you do and so with you, Jonathan. Okay, thank you very much. So, yes, I'm a senior digital specialist at the National Audit Office. I'm part of our central digital insights team. So, we've been looking at digital data, technology, and cyber security for the government for a number of years, and we've um, produced a number of reports in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sean, over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, so I'm I'm Kian Galvin, and uh, I'm I'm responsible for IoT product security and and cyber skills here in, in DCMS, and broadly we work to the digital and tech agenda. And as a department, own the the digital strategy and the uh, the national data strategy, as well as work quite closely on the the national cyber cyber strategy as well. Excellent. Thank you. And apologies for my terrible pronunciation of the name. It's Absolutely so great. Well now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, let's move over to Liban. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, Liban and Gal, uh, category lead at Crown Commercial Service. So uh, we're a procurement organization, ultimately. Um, and I lead it uh, uh, category experts, commercial experts, essentially, in cybersecurity. Um, and our role really is to support the, the UK public sector in bringing viable routes to market for things like cybersecurity. Brilliant, thank you. And, and John Cook. Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm John Cook. I'm head of uh, assurance, cyber security assurance at the Ministry of Defence. So I lead a team that are assessing the 6,500 different product, uh, projects that we've got ongoing at any one time. And I'm also uh, working at the moment to transform the way that we do assurance uh, or accreditation as it's currently called. Uh, and we're calling that approach secure by design. Excellent, thank you. I think you can agree we have an expert panel with you today. So just like I said before, if you have any questions as the panel is speaking, please do pop them in the ask your question box and I'll try and put them to the panel. Um, Jonathan, I thought we'd start with you if that's okay. Um, and I wanted to ask, yeah. how is the government tackling the challenges of legacy systems? Well, I thought it's uh, very interesting that in the introduction you said government's looking to digitally transform overnight. Um, I, I think anybody who represents an organisation with a large legacy estate will know that that isn't going to be the case necessarily. Um, so what we've seen in government, there's a broad spectrum of approaches. So you can have major departments that are looking to replace big big systems with, with, with new services. Um, so we've reported on, for example, the Home Office looking to replace the Police National Computer with the National Law enforcement data program because that's known to be coming out of vendor support 
that program, I think it's fair to say, has had a slightly bumpy ride. Alternatively, you, you can look at departments that have come to realise that the legacy estate now, cyber risk has reached a level higher than they're prepared to tolerate. And so we also see approaches where, as an immediate way of remediation, those systems are being moved into the cloud. And that goes a long way to addressing some of the cyber issues. But as you'll know, if, if something is just lifted and shifted into cloud, that isn't necessarily addressing the application level security. So yes. those are the broad approaches. But yes, it's what our main message is government, of course, is not greenfield. Government is brownfield. And it's getting from where we are to where we want to be. And that's what we try and help in our work. Yeah, and Jonathan, I know you mentioned cloud because we'll be talking a lot about that today, cloud technology. Um, and, and just a quick one again for you, Jonathan, what particular challenges then have you seen arising from the pandemic? Well, it's, I think it depended on where the organisation started off. So here in the NAO, we, we, we're quite a mobile organisation. We have people out in the field at, at a, a large parts of the year and I've personally had an internet enabled laptop for about 20 odd years now but for those organizations that largely um, worked on premise and people used to turning up to offices that's been a big challenge and I, I know John this will resonate with you how you move from an organization where people access their systems in secure environments to having to work from home that has created all sorts of cyber challenges and I think a lot of organizations have actually risen very well to those challenges from what we've seen. Well, John, let me bring you in because, um, you know, I understand the MOD is implementing a, a secure by design approach. What is the thinking behind that approach? So the thinking behind it is that um, uh, culturally we've had an issue where um, projects have not really felt responsible for their security. Um, too often a project would uh, get quite a long way down the road go oh i've got this intractable problem you know policy rewrite something uh in, invent something new in architecture to solve this problem and we really wanted to shift the conversation left as they might say um so that people who are accountable for a project think very much up front about you know how are they going to connect to legacy systems uh how challenging is my project in cyber terms so it won't be right down you know talking about controls or anything but it's like I'm building a new aircraft. How, how cyber aware do I need to be? How do I set up for success? Um, and so, so shift left um, was, is very important. Um, we still want people to reuse designs where they're applicable. There's always that conversation about um, innovation versus reuse, but um, a lot of these problems have been solved. Why, why do some projects uh, want to do it all again from scratch? I have to reassure it as well. Uh, we want um, uh, people to be very, we do want a set of basic rules of the road that sort of comes from the conversation about innovation versus new technology. Uh, we don't might we, we do want new technology, we want to exploit the very best. Um, it could be battle winning, but how we go about that, um, there are some basic rules of the road if you want to integrate within the infrastructure. And then finally, and most importantly, is, as I said at the beginning, projects to feel accountable for their own security. Okay, thanks uh, for that, John. Um, Keen, just bringing you in here um, with the DCMS, uh, why are you trying to bring a focus on securing IoT devices by, de by design? Perfect, thank you, yes. Well, I think I think fundamentally the, that connected technologies, kind of the IoT, it's increasingly common in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, and the, the, the technology really does transform the way we live and work, and it can really improve productivity, efficiency, and, and connectivity. So as, as was set out in the, in the recent um, digital strategy, you know, the, the government is committed to ensuring that these benefits are felt across the UK and that there is a large uh, amount of devices already in play up to almost 40 billion uh, or 40 million sorry connections by 2024 but these benefits come with risk and I think we're seeing a, a few examples of that so for example in in 2016 there was the uh, the Mirai malware that disrupted around 
300,000 products and use that collective computing power to, to take down kind of many news and, and media websites. Um, there was also an instance where there was a cyber attack that uh, was able to get through on a vulnerability in a fish tank in a casino. And I think what, what, this, what this shows is that while we enjoy the benefits and enjoy the opportunities presented by these types of devices, we have to make sure they are secure by design because ultimately that's, that's what lowers the risk of, of, of cyber attack in the future to consumers, to businesses and, and throughout the UK. And, and Livan, let me bring you in because what role does security play in a product that you bring to the market? Yeah, so um, I think in, 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 in summary, uh, security is a key consideration from the outset of a project right the way through to um, its product lifecycle. Um, this is because we have a team of security architects who are actually embedded and integrated into the development teams as part of a project. Um, which means cyber considerations are embedded into the digital systems and services at almost every step of that life cycle. Um, we also build um, products um, uh, in following an agile methodology and our DevOps uh, structure allows the InfoSec team to work directly with those squads um, from the outset as well. Now, in terms of actually um, overarching frameworks that the team may follow, um, I, an approach that, that I know they do follow is things like um, NCSE, Secure by Design Principles, you know, OWASP.10, uh, CIS standards, right the way through to um, the government uh, functional standard, I think it's 007 on security, which is designed to encourage a coherent and consistent way of working across government. So <coughs> fairly small team, but actually quite industrious in, in the way they operate. Excellent, thank you. And I have noticed that we do have a question. Um, so I'm going to put it to the panel and you know, whoever feels that they want to answer, you know, just speak up. Um, and this is from Ben Newman Wright. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for being so engaged this morning because you, you had a few questions in our first panel too, which we like. Um, is there a more secure alternative to Docker which can generally be applied? For example, creating an environment um, closer to that used to analyze malware. I don't know if there's anyone who'd like to take that. Is it resonating with anyone? <laughs> it might be one then that we keep a hold of Ben um, and we can uh, try and respond to that at another point. Um, but if, if it you know, connects with um, any of our panels at any point, just mention it in a, in a little while. Um, so just to continue really, I mean, um, keen to come back to you because obviously you mentioned how important um, Secure by Design is. How are you actually implementing it at the DCMS? Yeah, so I think that I think there is a few, sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. A bit of feedback. Is that myself? Grand. Grand. <laughs> so I think overall what we're doing with DCMS is two uh, primary approaches. One is legislation. So we're currently introducing the product security and telecoms infrastructure bill through through Parliament. And this will look to mandate um, three essential security requirements that all manufacturers must meet uh, for any any uh, consumer connected products that they they produce and make available to UK consumers. And I think that's the kind of first step, that's the first piece of legislation worldwide that's looked to, to do this ex exact thing. So that's one approach we've taken. And the other is a kind of a government-wide approach on the, um, the kind of funding game-changing semiconductor design. So all devices use a semiconductor and most of those devices are, are in digital technology and they, need to ensure that those semiconductors are secure by design because the vulnerabilities in there can be due to design flaws with the with the with the chips themselves and as part of this there was the digital security by design challenge announced in january 2019 and this is a base led uh security program and it partners with arm to to develop a, a kind of a processor prototype so ultimately, there's one kind of legislation piece that looks to address the problems here and now, and there's one funding of game-changing design that looks to address the problem in part in the in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to you, Jonathan, um, you know, from the National Audit Office perspective, 
what will you be looking to see, um, you know, in, in your audits? Well, our role is fairly well defined um, constitutionally. So we're, our, we're the public spending watchdog. So our role is to audit the financial statements of all central government bodies and report to parliaments on how departments and other organisations have used their resources. So where we would come at it is looking at how organisations are understanding and managing their risks. So obviously as part of financial statements audit, most business risks ultimately have a financial impact. So we'd, we'd be looking at that. But at a high level, what, what we'd expect organisations to be able to describe is a balanced approach which considers the people, so that's culture, behaviour and skills, and processes and governance as well as technology. So we, we take the view that al although there are the, the more specialist elements in, in cyber security and it can get very, very technical, um, as our uh, previous question on Docker showed, um, time and again, experts stress that just getting the simple basics right goes an awfully long way to providing protection. And I don't think it's necessary for people to have deep and specific cyber skills be able to make valid and insightful assessments of the wider control environment that will help organisations be secure by design. Excellent, thank you. And uh, I have noticed we have another question that's come in from Tej Goodka, and again, I'll put it to the room. Um, he asks, are you generally seeing shorter contracts being taken out due to cyber considerations around hardware slash software support? Is there anyone who'd like to pick up on that one? Um, I, I, I'll take that one. From the CCS perspective, I don't think we're seeing shorter contracts, although I think that's where the, the industry is heading anyway. So people want to avoid lock-in. Um, you know, technology changes at such a rapid rate. Um, you know, we're not seeing, uh, outside of outsourcing, very long-term four plus five years contracts for, for, for certain um, segments. But um, I would say that's more of a, a symptom of the technology sector rather than anything to do with cybersecurity specific. Brilliant. Thank you, Liban. And actually just staying with you, and also thank you for that question as well. Um, but Liban, I was wondering, you know, in terms of trends, um, what are you seeing in relation to cybersecurity spending? And you know, what does it tell you about the state of security in the sector? Yeah, so um, it, it's an I mean, it's an encouraging sector, number one. Um, you know, so d depending on which source you look at, um, we estimate that the UK cybersecurity market is worth around £2 billion a year, or at least in 2021 it was. And that's for like key segments uh, such as uh, software, hardware, uh, consultancy and advisory, and also managed security services. Um, and we estimate about 20% of that um, awarded contract is, is the public sector share. Um, and in terms of CCS share, it's probably around 50 to 60 percent of that uh, UKPS share. Now, these figures aren't perfect uh, because obviously um, it represents, I think, the, the, the tip of the iceberg, as it were, because it, it's what we can see in terms of contract awards on an annual basis. It doesn't take into account very large outsourcing agreements that routinely have cybersecurity baked into them. So actually, the market itself is probably a lot larger. Um, one of the interesting insights really is that most of this growth over the last couple of years since the pandemic has been fueled by uh, cloud and SaaS sales and also managed security services. Um, cloud and SaaS sales are driven by things like digital transformation projects. You know, uh, folks went from working in offices to, you know, a hybrid uh, work environment overnight as a, cause, as a result of the pandemic. And that's kind of continued. Um, and in, in relation to managed security services, that's growing because folks are finding it really difficult to recruit and retain in-house talent. So that buy, buyers are having to go out and buy these services in. So um, I guess, in, you know, in summary, it's a very dynamic marketplace with high levels of competition. It's in really, really good shape um, from a competition's perspective. Um, and, and the sector's um, share of total tech spend is also growing as well. Um, and we expect that to carry on actually up, up probably up, up until about the mid uh, middle of this um, uh, decade to probably reach um, around three billion pounds of awarded contracts on an annual basis as cybersecurity becomes more of a priority. Excellent, thank you. Uh, um, John, I just wanted to go back to you because you know clearly everyone in, in this um, space is championing secure by design. 
Uh, but I wonder, how is the MOD persuading project to take this seriously? Yeah, so so just think it sort of links into some of the things we're already discussing. Um, one of the issues that we had was that a lot of our projects are very, very big. So to, people tend to put lots of things into one bucket and then it takes quite a long time to get a project running. And then if you don't contract on time, um, you end up with legacy on your previous service. So we have been thinking hard about concepts like service owners as opposed to a lead for a project. So traditionally, we'd say there's a senior responsible owner, um, deliver this project by date X for, for contract price, whatever, um, or budget price, whatever. Um, so first of all, we're thinking of we're rearranging how we do digital projects to give service ownership as a concept make someone accountable for replacement of a system because uh, as i said a lot of it was because a project would stop that project lead has gone uh and then it would uh just not be replaced on time so being timely is really important secure by design itself as i said the shift left etc the accountability of an sro um who may also be a service owner um is about being much tighter over financial control. So very early on with very big projects like a you know replacement aircraft carrier or whatever, um, there's so it's such a big project to go, security is the big issue here. Well, clearly there's lots of issues to be solved. Um, but they they won't get through their financial approvals anymore, even right up front, unless they can demonstrate that they've got this risk management approach and they've identified their risks relating to cybersecurity. Don't have to do it specifically in a you know a, a uh, cybersecurity risk register, but it must form part of their case, and it and it must be able to demonstrate that within their main register register they've addressed it. So, asking those questions very early on and continuing through life is what this is about. So it's really lifting, um, lifting the sort of strategic gaze of my assessors from detailed controls, and they probably, by the way, some of my team will have known that answer about Docker. Um, but actually to lift it, to, I, I could probably find out later if you want. Uh, but um, it's really lifted the gaze to a much more uh, sort of strategic approach. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, John. Um, and one thing that, you know, is in argue, we can't argue about is the fact that it's not just the UK that's facing a problem with cybersecurity. It's clearly something that is worldwide. And Keen, I wondered... You know, how important is it to bring international partners into this? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's exactly that. It's it's very important because cybersecurity is ultimately a, a global global issue and it affects products that are on a, a global market. Um, and so how do we make sure that the products made available in the UK but also to to international partners are benefiting from that secure by design principle? And I think in order to achieve this on IoT specifically, we, we've we've taken a dual approach of establishing and, and collaborating with international partners to agree on a fundamental set of standards for what does good security look like for certain types of IoT devices, and agree that as the baseline, um, and that that that's been done for the for the consumer uh, for IoT products made available to consumers uh, and established through uh, the Etsy international organization and it's the, the, the kind of the first international standard that recognizes what uh, good security should look like for these type of products so we have those standards to baseline and inform the conversation and then we also have international engagement with with industry which is essential because ultimately it is, it's industry that makes the products. And um, for example, through, through the World Economic Forum, we've, we've worked and, and understood that statements have come out signed by over 100 organizations to agree to that baseline. So what we're seeing is that this collaboration is establishing a common sense of, a, a common sense of what the approach should be. And then industry is taking that on and running with it. Um, and so I think it's, it's continuing to keep that momentum internationally so we can uh, resolve the, the UK issue, but also resolve it much wider as well. Yeah, thank you, Keen. And, and as you were saying momentum, that's what I was thinking in my head, because clearly you know, there is this sea change that is happening and the fact that we're all here discussing this and it's, it's, you know, it's not going away, it's so important. As Brinda said earlier in her keynote speech, it's not 
a case of if, it's it's when uh, we'll be affected. Um, and on that note, uh, Jonathan, because I'm conscious that we've only got about three minutes left. And actually, you know, I was going to ask you a question, but we've got a question that's come to the room. So I'm going to um, take that rather than ask the question that I had. Um, and it's a question from Samar. Thank you so much for this. Um, and Samar asks, what is the difference between the good security for the public and private companies? What is the difference between the good security for the public and private companies? I don't know if that's something that anyone feels they can pick up on. What is the I, I, oh yeah, sorry, Keith. Go for will it. I, will I take a, a, a quick go at it? I, I think overall, th there will be differences between the security we expect for products that are made available to the wider public and those made available to, to enterprise. You know, there, there's a there's a slightly different risk profile. There's um, uh, a connection to slightly more no, networks containing slightly more sensitive data, and I think what we have to be clear on is is what's the baseline for everyone. And then how does that differ the more you go along the line uh, for, for consumers and for, for enterprise as well? And I think what we're finding is with the enterprise yeah. space, that really needs to be explored more on a, on a kind of macro policy level. Are, what, what further should be done in that space to make sure products used are, are, are right? And I think there's a, um, a, a beta set of uh, security principles that are actually out for, for consultation at the moment, looking at that specific problem from an enterprise angle. Um, as opposed to the consumer angle we've taken with legislation. So different considerations, but broadly starting from the same baseline, if, if that in any way answers the question. I think if I can come in as well, I think what I'd note, though, those of us who've been in the public sector a long time might remember the days of the GSI, the Government Secure Intranet, where everything was very prescriptive and there was a very strict code of connection. CESG had to approve specific devices and um, software. And then we saw the gradual move to a, a more, uh, well, we moved from GSI to PSN, which initially began with a zero tolerance approach and then a much more relaxed. And then we had the approach, the internet is okay. And National Cybersecurity Centre guidance, now it's open to everyone. It's not just specific to the government, it's, it's there for all. So I think it's best practice that can cover both the public and private sectors alike. Although noting exactly what Keen said about understanding where the differences are as well. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for that question, too. Um, I'm going to be wrapping up shortly. We've only got about a minute and a half left. Um, but Jonathan, just so I can, you know, in a kind of nutshell, um, the question I was going to ask you before was, you know, how can organisations ensure good cybersecurity practices? Of course, we've discussed this in, in length, but if there was you know, a take home that you would like to share, what would it be? Well, we've produced um, a couple of guides on our website, one on cloud specifically and then one on cyber and information security and as i said at the start these are really targeted at the at the senior lay lay person so audit and risk committees non-executives and this sets out very high level questions that they should be asking of their management and i think if organizations read and applied those it would stand in a very good stead on the base excellent thank you and that's such a great way to end our panel. Uh, thank you so much to Jonathan Pownall, to Keen Galvin, to Liban Engel, and also to John Cook for joining us today. Um, we are going to take a break now. Um, and obviously, we've got this opportunity as well for you to explore the PSV365 platform, uh, take a look at the digital marketplace, or perhaps try a bit of speed networking. Um, and we will be back at 11.35. So we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.